I'm Nicole Ferraro, and this is The Divide, a podcast from Light Reading exploring the ongoing digital divide, why and where it still exists, and what needs to be done to get people everywhere connected to reliable, high-speed internet. Today, I am joined by Gigi Sohn, a longtime advocate for broadband access, including in her role as an advisor to former FCC Chair Tom Wheeler, as well as in her current capacity as Senior Fellow and Public Advocate at the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, and now in her newly accepted role of Executive Director at the American Association for Public Broadband. This past March, Gigi withdrew her nomination for FCC Commissioner after being nominated by President Biden in October 2021 and following a grueling Senate confirmation process. We talk about what that process says about the state of the industry, what her most urgent goals would have been as FCC Commissioner, how she hopes to use her new position to advocate for public broadband, and much more. Gigi, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, Nicole. It is such a privilege for me to get to speak with you today. Thank you so much for making time for this. Um, So we have a lot to talk about, uh, but to start things off, I wanted to start with your your unfortunate nomination process, uh, which we endured together, I'll say. Um, (laughs) Me in my apartment, angrily, you uh, before the Senate too many times. Um, But just uh, for a little backstory, you were nominated by President Biden for FCC Commissioner back in October 2021. You had an unprecedented three confirmation hearings, and then you withdrew your nominate from the nomination in, in March. So, um, what I want to know from you is, what do you think your nomination process says about the state of the industry and broadband policy in this country? Well, I think it says a lot about the nominations process generally, and that it's mm. broken, uh, and that the process is just full of at least my process. And now you can name at least a half a dozen other nominations processes, almost all women, by the way, and mostly women of color that have been polluted by dark money. You know, it's one thing if, you know, industry wants to oppose me in their own name. Right. And, and obviously Rupert Murdoch and and Fox (laughs) did that. They they didn't make any bones about it. But other industry players, other uh, conservative right wing players wouldn't put their name uh, to their opposition to me. So instead, they use dark money uh, entities, most particularly the American Accountability Foundation, to really just spout lies and mischaracterizations and, 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 and make me into a caricature of what I really am. And like I said, if you want to put your name out there and say, you know, we're X broadband company, we're X media company, and, you know, we think Gigi shouldn't be chair because she's pro net neutrality or, you know, pro bringing back uh, media ownership rules. That's fine. But to not actually say who you are, be completely transparent and give your money to an organization that does not have to reveal its donors, that to me was what was so striking about my process. Look, I've been a consumer advocate my whole career, and while I've worked with industry, you know, there's no segment of industry that I haven't agreed with and disagreed with, right? I mean, and that's always kind of been my stock and trade is that I'll listen, and if we can work together on Common Cause, we will. Uh, but that never kind of got out there. What got out there was that, you know, I was a media censor, I was anti-police, which I thought was insane because... <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth, and 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 the Fraternal Order of Police has pretty much almost nothing to do with the FCC, and certainly not anything that they complained about, like encryption or you know uh, or you know th- that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, as a consumer advocate, I expected to get some opposition on the merits. Right? She's too regulatory. She's pro net neutrality. She wants to bring back, you know black telephone uh, regulation back to broadband. But again, the lies and the caricatures, that's what I didn't expect. That again, it was all under the guise of dark money and just sort of, you know, dark connections that nobody could reveal. Yeah. And another time you're like the support that you had from both sides of the aisle, you know, the, the, your record would have uh, pushed past those kinds of attacks, but there was something super cynical about uh, the way this process went down. 
um, that speaks, I guess, as you're sort of alluding to a larger issue with our democracy at the moment. Yes, absolutely. And like I said, you know, if you if you do a little careful look at uh, how many of Biden's nominees have failed, and it's not a small number. I wish I could say it's a small number. Mine and some of the others, um, like Neera Tandon for OMB uh, or um, <clears throat> Saul Omarova for the Fed or Sarah Bloom Raskin for the Fed, you know, those are high profile, but there are dozens more folks that just drop out because they can't afford or they're just tired of the process you know, they can't afford, you know, to stick out the process as long as I can, or they're tired of the process or they just kind of give up. You know, it's, it's unfortunately a very, very long list. And I guess the days of where the president, the president's party voted with the president to give him the nominee that he wants, unfortunately, seem to be over. Indeed. All right. Well, let's transition from this or I'll, I'll keep you on this topic for the next six hours. Um, <laughs> if you had been confirmed as you should have been, um, it would have been, you know, your first time as serving as a commissioner on the FCC, but your return to the uh, commission because you were uh uh, you served with uh, Chairman Wheeler. Um, so I would love to know, you know, what were you excited to get back to? What do you uh, think really needs to happen at the FCC right now? What were you eager to get your, you know, to dig into over there? Well, let me say first what I was really looking forward to. <clears throat> I was looking forward to being back in an agency that I really, really love. Uh, I loved working there. I really enjoyed it. I got along with everybody. I knew every security guard's name. You know, I just, I, I really wanted, A, to make policy from the inside again, and B, uh, I wanted to be part of a team again. You know, I had thoughts about who my staff might be, and I was really looking forward to being back with the folks who'd been there for their career. You know, when I was at the FCC with uh, with Chairman Wheeler, I really learned about how dedicated the staff was. And I also was able to kind of push back on on things that even I thought of for years that the FCC is a captured agency and, you know, people just looking for their next job. And I and that may be true of some people at the agency, but the vast majority of them really, really want to serve the public. And I was looking forward to, to going back and working with those folks again because I really enjoyed it the first time. So institutionally and personally, that's what I was looking forward to. Policy wise, my there's 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 so much that needs to be done that's not getting done. You know, obviously, top of mind for me would be reinstating the FCC's authority to oversee the broadband market under Title II of the Communications Act, and at the same time, working with Congress to give the FCC statutory authority. Because as maybe we'll discuss later, I'm very concerned about the Supreme Court and what they might do to the Chevron case and what they might do to FCC authority mm -hmm. uh, in this area. But, you know, job one is the FCC was set up in 1934 to oversee communications networks and access to communications networks. And right now, it does not have the power to protect consumers or competition when it comes to the most important communications network of our lifetime. And that just can't be. Yeah. Uh, and you're seeing the FCC hamstrung from doing things like enforcing privacy violations, enforcing, you know, bold mapping violations where the where the where the some of the ISPs actually admit, yeah, we lied. <laughs> and there's the FCC can't do anything about it. Uh, a because it's deadlocked and B because it doesn't have authority. So that obviously was incredibly important to me and I made no bones about it. Mm -hmm. uh, two other things that I th and there's many, but I'll just mention two because I like the rule of three is uh, completing the digital discrimination rulemaking. So under the um, infrastructure bill, the broadband provisions of the infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. the FCC has to determine um, <clears throat> what to do if they find an ISP is discriminating uh, against a neighborhood, against individuals uh, based on their race, gender, income level, and a whole other host of, of, of issues. Um, and the question in front of the FCC right now is, are we going to are they going to look at, you know, whether there's discrimination as a matter of intent? Did somebody actually write an email saying, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to give crummy service to this, you know, low income area yeah. or just as a matter of fact? You know, right. Is that, is that the result? If the result is discrimination and that, that's what I would want to see. Right. I mean, if if you de facto 
discriminating against, then there has to be, I don't want to use the word punishment, there has to be some sort of fix. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps depending on, you know, whether there is intent or whether there are other mitigating factors, maybe there has to be punishment as well, uh, as opposed to, well, you know, if the person, if the ISP didn't intend to discriminate, then they get off scot-free. So that's really important. Thirdly, uh, is fixing the broken universal service fund contribution mm-hmm. mechanism. And that's tied in, you know, and, and, and both Democrats and Republicans have kicked that can down the road for so many years. And yeah. it's untenable. You've got a contribution mechanism that's near 30%. You have a shrinking base. And you have a lot of other entities that could contribute to that base and, and to shrink according to, to, you know, to one group that is advocating for um, uh, broadband providers, uh, broadband ISPs to contribute. You could bring that down from 30% to 4% and also grow the pot of money. And that pot of money may have to grow significantly if Congress does not renew or refund the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is the $30 or $75 if you live on tribal land subsidy for broadband. And I've been hearing that even if the FCC and even if Congress does refund the ACP, they will not do it uh, for the long term. It will be a short term fix. So the can can't keep getting kicked down the road. Yeah. I'd like to see the Klobuchar Thune bill pass, which says to the FCC, you must do this. Uh, but short of that, uh, I'd like to see the FCC leadership say, we must do this because they really they really have to. And, you know, the pot may shrink a little bit because of all the money in the infrastructure bill, right? Or it actually might shrink significantly. Sure. So maybe you shift some money over to... Um, I would rename Lifeline ACP just, you know, for historical reasons, Lifeline has gotten, a, unfortunately, a bad rap. Uh, but I do think, you know, unless something seriously changes and Congress decides to make the ACP a, a permanent entitlement, which is what I'd like to see, mm-hmm. that that the ACP is going to have to be folded into the Universal Service Fund somehow. Because mm-hmm. you so, can't, you yeah. can't have 18 million households on ACP and then all of a sudden say, say, sorry, we're out of money. Yeah. So I want to come back to you on basically everything you just brought up. So first of all, with digital discrimination, I'm laughing a little bit as you're talking because I've read all of the filings. I know where the industry stands on this issue and it's that they only believe uh, it should be defined as intentional and, you know, that their idea of discrimination is, you know, it happens because the poll attachment laws are too stringent or something like it's, it's not. Um, so the, the filings, like they couldn't be more, uh, you know, uh, far apart in terms of what the industry is arguing and uh, what what consumer advocates are arguing and what you're what you're suggesting. So uh, I'm not optimistic on how that ruling, how those rules are eventually going to come down. Are you? Well, not today, not with a, not with a two two, and right. it's unclear to me whether we'll have a three two. And depending on who that three is, I may be more optimistic or less optimistic. Right. You right. know, people people are tossing around names, they're tossing around times. Look, I I am fully aware of you know the lobbyist rumor game and oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Look, you know, I I uh, I got vetted starting at the end of May of 2021 and my vetting was over by the end of June. And I started getting phone calls from lobbyists congratulating me <laughs> on my, not my imminent nomination, <laughs> which happened, which came four months later. Yeah. So I, you know, I, what I love about light reading is that you, you don't trade in rumor and you don't trade in uh, anonymous tips and lobbyists say, and, you know, I have to say, I'm generally disappointed with our trade press, because, you know, you know, lobbyists say people in the know say people close to the process say, yeah. And, you know, people would ask me, well, what does the white house think? And I would say, ask the white house, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's, but there, there is a whole stock and trade in just rumor mongering and lies, uh, among the K street crowd that I think is, is really unfortunate. And for me, it was extraordinarily stressful. I don't, I don't want to go back to, we can go back to the nominations process, but I would be really, really cautious before I believed anything I read 
that said, oh, XYZ person is the leader and they're going to be nominated on, you know, in this period of time. Uh, it's very unclear to me when the White House is going to nominate somebody. And it's actually becoming increasingly unclear who they're going to nominate. So I just wouldn't believe any of the rumors. Yeah. And of course, as we know, a nomination isn't swiftly followed by a confirmation hearing and and vote. uh, And the Senate is more precarious by the day. So um, uh, which, you know, gets to my other concern about, like you mentioned, both um, Lifeline, the ACP, Uh, according to a hearing I watched the other day, uh, a House hearing on broadband, um, I, I did have not seen this letter firsthand, but a Democratic uh, House member mentioned that all of the Republicans on that oversight committee sent a letter uh, uh, ask, asking the FCC if they're preparing for the uh, for providers to get off of the temporary ACP. So that tells me that uh, Republican members of Congress are not necessarily uh, going to bat for uh, refunding that program, um, if that's true. So well, again... <laughs> I well, here, so that. here's here. There are a couple things going on. First of all, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed overall. I watched the Senate hearing uh, uh, the, on the Universal on Service, Universal which is Service, my other right. was going to mention. So please just give go ahead and give your thoughts. Right, on and I have to yeah. say I was a little bit disappointed that nobody on either side was really uh, in Congress. Obviously, some of the witnesses were mm-hmm. uh, were really advocates for refunding the ACP and or folding the ACP into universal service. There are a number of people advocating on both sides for universal service contribution reform. And of course, there's some divide in, you know, who should be included, uh, you know, in in, in the pot of money. But I'm I'm not seeing a whole lot of leadership on the Hill. You know, somebody who's making it their business, his or her business, every single day to wake up and say, how do we get the ACP refunded? And yet you have Congress people going out. Leader Jeffries was out this last weekend uh, in the Bronx promoting the ACP. Uh, those conversations be uh, should be accompanied by uh, public declarations of a need for funds, I would think, but they're not. Yes, I I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm not actually hearing that much from F- FCC leadership either. You know, no. I understand the reticence to ask Congress to do its job, but you know that that is something that the FCC does do. It does suggest to Congress, you know help us out here. Mm -hmm. What I'm also finding interesting is, particularly among Republicans, they're claiming that um, the ACP is not bringing in new customers. It's only helping current customers. And number one, so my Benton colleague, uh, John Horrigan, just put out a study on the ACP that actually shows that it is bringing in new customers. But to the extent that it's also serving old customers, what it's doing, it's keeping people online. I was talking uh, to one of the government relations people for one of the big ISPs, and and she told me that what happens is low-income people, they'll get it for a few months, and then they'll drop it when they have to pay for groceries or some other need, you know, and they'll get it and they'll drop it and they'll get it and they'll drop it. And there's a value in keeping that person online. So it doesn't matter to me if you qualify if you're low income and you qualify, I don't care if you're a current customer or a new customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you should be able, if you're eligible, you should be able to get the get the money because maybe that $30, again, goes to feed your family or goes to fix your car or goes to buy, you know, three fifty dollars a gallon gas. So, you know, I, that doesn't trouble me, but I'm, I'm kind of seeing that meme. Now, and I will say, you know, there's 18 million on there now, but the FCC just gave out a whole bunch of grants to, um, uh, you know, digital inclusion, digital equity groups to get more people on. Mm-hmm. So more people will get on, and that's fantastic. And you're <laughs> going to get more of that folks that aren't on at all. Right. But it, it's great in that regard. It's terrible in regard that it's going to, the money's going to run out faster. So, you know, I don't want to compare it to the debt ceiling because one will actually might actually uh, uh, result in the collapse of, you know, of a whole financial system. Yeah, but um, yeah. it is kind of like that. It's, it's a game of chicken. But what, again, when I'm not seeing I, I need to see more, you know, folks on the Hill and frankly, at the agency saying this is a crisis and you're yeah. talking about kicking over, you know, off millions of households who are relying upon this program we can't, we can't have this. And if the best you can do right now 
is just like, you know, a year or two more of money while we fix universal service contribution reform. Okay, but you can't just let it lapse. Yeah, that's better than nothing to let it lapse. And especially, you know, the anyone who gets a bead grant as well is a spe- is required to provide some sort of low income um, plan. So the assumption has been it, it would be the ACP all along. I guess that would put the onus on providers to come up with their own plans that they can offer. Yes, uh, but that, pl- you know, depending on what the plan is, you know, the customer may still need the ACP, mm-hmm. right? If it's a, so the example that, that NTIA uses is a $30 a month plan. Well, for some people, $30 a month is $30 too much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know there's this, again, it's mostly Republicans. Well, they have to have skin in the game. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've never understood that, you know, again, you know, these are folks, many folks, but for that subsidy would either have to, you know, have interrupted service or not have it at all. So yeah. it was originally, if you remember, in the emergency broadband benefit, it was a $40. F- 50. Uh, it was 50. Okay, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> no I problem. should have known that because I, a- I was one of the people that helped push the EBB and I actually worked with the carriers to get yeah. it. So now it's down to 30. Yeah. Uh, that or, and, and, and again, the rationale for that among Republicans was, well, we want folks to put skin in the game. Yeah. So they're already putting skin in the game. Right. Uh, uh, so let's let's bring it back. Absolutely. All right. Let me come back to one other topic you mentioned, uh, and you mentioned this in the context of FCC oversight, which was broadband mapping. I thought it was really smart of you during your third and final hearing to mention to uh, the senators who are you know hysterical about the state of the FCC broadband map that your confirmation would allow you to actually you know help it get to the finish line and improve it. Um, what's your? Uh, yeah, sorry that that didn't work. Uh, there were bigger things at play. But <laughs> what's your uh, perspective on um, the current state? of the map and are you confident about you know the improvements they're making in time for bead funding and we can get into you know bead a little bit more after that yeah look i know the agency is trying but i was i just came back from houston to the at the broadband communities conference and um (laughs) there were a couple of state panels on uh you know with state advocates on there about mapping and needless to say uh they were not happy so, um, you know, some states are going to be fine, right? Eastern st- seaboard, seaboard states, uh, populous states, they're going to be fine. It's the, it's the really rural states. It's the ones that have, you know, town centers far apart. Uh, you know, Nevada happens to be one of the states that is, is really most apoplectic about it, and their senators have both been very active in that regard. So I would say, look, the maps are not going to be perfect, and I think the FCC would admit that. Uh, I think they're going to be a far sight better than maybe they were a few months ago. But the fact of the matter, matter is, on June 30th, some states are going to be hosed. And <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm using a nice term. <laughs> and I, I think the question has got to be moving forward. You know, I, again, there's not enough time to perfect the maps. And the map is iterative, right? It, it will get better and better and better. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, anyway, uh, is how do you hold those states that are going to get hosed? How do you hold them harmless? Mm-hmm. And one of the things I suggested in Houston, uh, and I think I've said in other places, is you know the FCC has sixteen billion dollars uh, that that's sitting in the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund that they don't really need to spend on deployment mm-hmm. since. Uh, between you know um, yeah, ARPA, the BEAD, treasury money, that, the yeah. ARPA money, and the and the bead money, you know, and the matches, right? The states yeah. have to or you have to get a twenty five percent match from somewhere. It could be states, philanthropy, whatever. Uh, that money could go to hold harmless some of the states that feel that they've been wronged mm. uh, by the map, and it, it's it, you won't use the whole sixteen billion. Right. So, for example, you know, the last I spoke to the head of the broadband office in Nevada, they were looking at possibly losing like two hundred million dollars. So, again, maybe that it'll be less by the time the maps come out. But I think the FCC and NTIA have to think about, you know, uh, what are we going to do to satisfy those states that feel that they they've gotten the wrong end? of the stick on the, uh, with regard to the map, because there will be more than several states that are going to complain. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way that they might have sort of other ways to compensate states that might not be satisfied. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I would love your perspective on BEAD, you know, $42.5 billion for broadband deployment. Uh, allegedly, the numbers will come out for state allocations on June 30th, like you just said. In the meantime, we should be getting grants um, for the Middle Mile program announced uh, sometime between now-ish and uh, the end of June. Um, you know, you uh, were at the FCC at a time when we were trying other stuff with broadband. Uh, what's your perspective on these new programs? Are you optimistic um, about uh, the outcome, you know, based on how the NTIA has written the rules? How, how are you feeling about all this? Look, I think NTIA has done a really, really great job. You know, there there are some things along the edges that dissatisfy just about everybody. But, you know, when you're talking about something so massive, a project pro- program so massive, the fact that they've been able, you know, pretty much to keep to their timelines and then overall, uh, you know, the the notice of funding opportunity is very solid. Uh, you know, they have program officers for every single state, uh, which is good. You're, you know, you're starting to see a lot of states um, growing their broadband offices. Like some states are way ahead of the curve and some are way behind. I mean, that's just going to be the nature. I'm also, you know, I'm, I, I'm working on a whole bunch of state projects and I'm seeing, you know, digital equity coalitions grow. And so, I mean, you know, NTIA anticipates that this is going to be a very holistic process where, you know, the state and state has to talk to a variety of stakeholders and has to work with the local communities. And, and if they do that and if they do that properly, I expect this to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, there, there's a big rush to get to, you know, the initial grant proposals in and that sort of thing, but there is time. And some of the States, again, are already, they're doing listening sessions and they're, you know, taking very seriously the needs of their local communities and the needs of their local stakeholders. But I, I think the key for the States is going to make sure that the process is competitive, mm-hmm. right? That they're not keeping anybody out and, you know, very important to me is to make sure that they don't keep out what NTIA calls non-traditional ISPs like community broadband providers, co-ops, you know, public-private partnerships. Yeah. So to make sure it's actually really competitive and they're just not throwing money to the incumbents because it's the easiest thing, that's important. It's also important that, you know, to the extent that there may be new players or even old players, they need to make sure that they have the managerial and technical and operational wherewithal to build the networks they promise. And this is what the federal government did not do. And, you know, it was mostly the FCC, but also the agriculture department uh, did not really do the kind of due diligence at the front end that was necessary. And that's why you had a lot of defaults. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, NTIA was given enough money by Congress uh, that I hope that's not going to happen again, but the main oversight is really going to fall to the states. And that is part of the grant proposal is you've got to show that, you know, you've got a procedure for, for overseeing, uh, you know, these, these networks being built. And lastly, there needs to be consequences if you don't, right? right? You you have to give the money back. Maybe you don't get to participate, <laughs> you know, in the next tranche of money, whenever that will be. And yeah, I think yeah. that's something else where the federal government fell short. You had companies like CenturyLink and Frontier who defaulted on their promises, and then they were allowed to participate in the yard off, right? So we can't have that. There needs to be consequences. I'd like to see consequences for those ISPs that, you know, uh, that lied about the mapping, but that's at the FCC. But again, the states and the NTIA both kind of concurrently have the ability, have the authority to do serious oversight. And and when it's oversight, it's not just like reading the report that the ISB sends you, right? right? It's going to the building site and making sure it's getting built. And, you know, the maps should be able to show you as these things are being built, what the speeds are. So, you know, I think oversight over the four years that these that these ISPs have to build and hopefully they'll be built in even shorter time, uh, you know, is really, really important. And again, consequences. If you don't do it or you're way behind, then you just get get back the money and let somebody else build. 
Very well said. Um, last thing, and then I'll let you go. We started this conversation on the job you unfortunately did not get, but more recently you accepted a new position um, as the executive director of the American Association for Public Broadband. So congratulations, first of all. Um, and second of all, I'd just love to hear what your vision is um, in your new position there. And uh, what do you see as some of the biggest success stories uh, in the U.S. for public broadband? Yeah, well, look, I think public broadband's time has come, uh, and not just because there's goo gobs of money sitting out there. Uh, I think overall, Americans are pretty dissatisfied with um, the lack of competition in broadband. And uh, I think they are more open to the idea of, you know, some sort of government supported broadband. And, you know, what troubles me is that is that the opponents of public broadband or community broadband, which tend to be the incumbents, have kind of set the parameters of the debate. And I want to really reset the parameters of the debate that public broadband networks, you know, are not looking at return on investment. They're looking at connecting all of their, you know, residents with affordable broadband and, and all of their residents, not just the wealthy ones. Uh, and that they can be a good choice for communities. You know, I'm not saying, and I'll never say, and I've never said that I think community broadband or public broadband is necessary for every community, but a community should have the freedom to choose whether it is. So my goals are to expand the number uh, of public broadband systems around the country and build a network uh, that can, you know, uh, speak to policymakers and make the case for themselves, really to promote public broadband as an option uh, for communities, particularly those communities that feel that they don't have enough competition or that the broadband that they have is, is, is not up to snuff, and also opposing uh, barriers and, and working to eliminate barriers. There's still, even though Colorado just lifted its um, restrictions on public broadband, there's still... 17 states uh, that have restrictions of various kinds. Some are just flat out bans. You know, government can have nothing to do with broadband. Others are things like, well, uh, if, for example, in Tennessee, you can't go beyond, if you're like an electrical uh, utility, like in Chattanooga, you can't go beyond your footprint. Right. Even So you can be a thousand feet away from, you know, uh, Chattanooga EPB and not get their service and instead have to rely on satellite and, and DSL and, you know, pay three or $400 a month. So one of, you know, I, I, there are some States that I will not mention that are looking at possibly lifting their restrictions because, you know, the debate, the pandemic ended the debate over whether broadband is a necessity or a luxury. And, um, and everybody needs to have it. And it is viewed whether, whether you like it or not, <laughs> Whether it's regulated that way or not, it's viewed as a utility like electricity and water, and communities are not going to be without it. Yeah. So, you know, the idea is to say, here's an option, here's how you succeed in that option. And they're, you know, again, despite the incumbents continuing to say they're all failures. I mean, this is the argument they've been making for 20 years, and there were failures 20 years ago. There are yeah. also failures in the private sector, but that's exactly. a whole other story, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, increasingly, there are more and more successes, and increasingly, they're not like a Chattanooga, where it's a municipality owning and operating. It's more, you know, public-private uh, partnership, where you have, for example, in Westminster, Maryland, where you have the, the county builds, uh, the, the, excuse me, the city builds the middle mile, mm -hmm. and says to ISPs, "Come one, come all." So you have these open access networks. Utopia in Utah is another extremely successful model, which is now they've just built in Bozeman. Bozeman. Yeah. Montana and they're looking at some other places. So I think if we can tell the positive story and maybe we can have even a mentorship program where a community looking to build can, you know, rely on a mentor in a community that has already built successfully, we can increase the number of, of networks out there. And it just becomes like a rolling stone. Then everybody wants to have it. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for all of your time today. And thank you for all of the incredibly important work you do to close the digital divide here in the U.S. Uh, really, your, your work is very appreciated. I think you're going to do awesome uh, stuff in this new role. Thanks a lot, Nicole. I appreciate it. 
Thank you again, Gigi, for joining me. Thank you as well to our producer, Pierre Landrio, for making this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the Light Reading Podcast for more episodes of The Divide, as well as interviews and insights from the Light Reading team. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.